Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Samantha Paulson, president of the CCAI Georgia chapter. And on behalf of all the CCAI chapters throughout the country, thank you for joining us today. It's been great to connect with the industry through this virtual platform with our webinar series. Be sure to check out the CCAI training and events calendar on the website for additional webinar offerings and upcoming CCAI chapter events. Our webinar today, Testing and Quality in a Competitive Environment, is presented by Delfesco Corporation, a U.S. manufacturer of test instruments. First, just so everyone is all aware, all attendees are muted. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the questions and answer box that should be visible on the right side of your screen, and all the speakers will address all questions at the end of the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Mike Beamish is the Vice President and General Manager of Delfesco Corporation. He has a degree in mechanical engineering with experience in the design, manufacture, and marketing of these instruments in a variety of international industries, including industrial painting, quality inspection, and manufacturing. Ian Maxwell is a Senior Product Specialist of Delfesco Corporation. He has degrees in business technology management and communications as well as over six years of experience in sales and support of Delfesco products. Thank you both for being here today, and I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Samantha. As, uh, you know, as Samantha mentioned, my name is Mike Beamish. I'm here with my colleague, Ian Maxwell, and uh, we might as well cut right over to the presentation. Uh, just a few clerical notes before we get started. First, if you do have a question or anything like that, feel free to enter it in the chat box. Ian and I will try to be watching that during the presentation. But if we do miss it because we're presenting, uh, then Kelly uh, or one of the other organizers will summarize everything for us at the end and we'll spend some time asking questions. I expect the presentation itself will take about 45 minutes and so we should have plenty of time for questions thereafter. So we'll get right to the presentation. So quality control, that's the reason we're all here and, it's be and quality control itself is becoming increasingly important in, our, in the competitive environment we're all working in. It can mean a lot of things. It's a subjective word. A quality control can mean really complicated computerized robotic uh, statistical systems, or it can mean just one person sitting on the end of the line with uh, the correct looking version of the part uh, and what comparing every part coming off the line to that correct version. To communicate expectations to employees, colleagues, or uh, customers, quantitative information is necessary to create and administer a good quality specification. There are a number of process control concerns that need to be verified to ensure that the finishing product process is in control and producing an acceptable product. So that's why it's important to incorporate all these tests into a comprehensive QA or QC plan. And that's, of course, means a quality assurance or quality control plan. Some of these tests require the purchase of special equipment or something like that, and some just require the materials you already have on site and a test standard, for example. So it really runs the whole range. And throughout this presentation, Ian and I will work to explain the ASTM test methods that explain how these test methods should be, these equipment or test methods should be used alongside the equipment itself. So again, in today's competitive environment, customers often choose the supplier that has the most solid quality control system. And by investing in some basic test instrumentation, coders can study trends, reduce costs, and retain customers by providing them with the documentation, showing them that their ability to meet the specification is there. So every applicator should know what equipment is available and how to use it. And that's the intent of this presentation is to provide that thousand foot overview of what equipment's out there. So with that said, here's the broad overview of how our presentation is gonna be divided up today. Number one there, coding properties. That's something that we should all be aware of, but we're not gonna discuss. And the reason for that is because those tests such as particle size and specific gravity, they're typically done by the coding manufacturer and not necessarily by the end user or the applicator. So it's important to know that this whole regime of testing is out there and you might see some of this information on your data sheets uh, and equipment specifications but it's really generally not something the applicators use, and so we'll, we won't cover it specifically. We will talk about surface and equipment preparation. That's getting your parts and the equipment that you're gonna be used to coat, the, that you're gonna use to coat the parts ready. And then there's the aesthetic coating characteristics. That really pertains to the look of the coating after it's been applied. 
the physical characteristics or the uh, yeah physical characteristics, the ability to withstand the environment the coating is going to be placed again placed in, and then environmental characteristics, which is similar to uh, physical characteristics, but gets more into specific weather or climactic environments that the coating will have to withstand. Then towards the end, we're going to briefly discuss paperless QA and the various methods that can be used to bring this information all together. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague Ian. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we're just going to start out uh, talking about surface and equipment prep. So we're going to talk uh, surface profile, uh, so measuring the uh, characteristics of the surface before it's coated. Environmental uh, testing grounding of parts and also temperature profile. So, first, uh, we're going to talk surface profile measurement. So, surfaces are frequently cleaned by abrasive impact, uh, mechanical abrading, or chemical cleaning prior to the application of powder. Uh, this process removes uh, unwanted materials like oils, dirt, mill scale, rust, or old coatings that might interfere with the development of a good coating adhesion uh, or might cause surface defects. Uh, many cleaning processes off, uh, also roughen the surface. Uh, so roughening the surface can help to promote adhesion of the uh, coating that will be applied. Uh, the resultant surface profile is comprised of a complex pattern of uh, peaks and valleys, uh, which can be accurately assessed in order to ensure compliance with job or contract specifications. Uh, if the peak to valley roughness is insufficient, the paint will have a tough time adhering to that product. Uh, if the peak to valley uh, roughness is is uh, too great, then the peaks may protrude through the coating and become a foci for corrosion. Uh, instruments that measure this profile with the highest degree of precision, such as scanning electron microscopes, are very expensive and uh, often are only suitable for laboratory use. So, in practice, powder coders will use. Uh, some of the other methods like depth micrometer, replica tape, and roughness instruments. So the first method is very simple. The depth micrometer instrument uh, simply measures the peak to valley blast profile height uh, using a stylus tip. Uh, the probe foot rests on the top of the profile, so the, the top of the peaks. And then the tip is allowed to fall into the valley. So the user will uh, take a series of readings and typically will uh, use the highest of that reading, uh, which will give the maximum profile height. The next method, uh, very common method, replica tape. Uh, it's been used for quite some time in the industry. Uh, very simple, relatively inexpensive, and is particularly useful for measurement on curved surfaces. Uh, it consists of a layer of compressible foam that is affixed to a, an incompressible polyester substrate, a uh, very uniform thickness. So when pressed into that roughened surface, the foam uh, forms a reverse replica of that surface the user then places the, uh, the burnished tape into the anvils of a spring micrometer. Uh, after subtracting out the thickness of the, the backing, they get the surface profile. Recent instrumentation also has allowed uh, some more information from replica tape. Uh, so, you're able to use digital imaging uh, with light transmitted through that tape and can capture a 3D uh, and 2D image uh, that gives quite a bit more information about the surface, like peak density. 
And last is a uh, roughness meter. So uh, this is a drag stylus type instrument. Um, the device basically operates by dragging a stylus uh, across the roughened surface at a constant speed. Uh, you then, it is recording the up and down movement of the stylus as it traverses across the surface, uh, dragging that stylus by about a half an inch. Next, we'll talk about environmental measurements. So it's very important to ensure that the environmental that the environment that the coating is being applied in is correct uh, prior to coating. So the five conditions that are measured or, or calculated would be air and surface temperature, relative humidity, and then from the humidity and air temperature, there's a calculation of dew point temperature. And then that is compared against the surface temperature because when the surface and dew point temperature meet, that is when dew will form on the surface. Next, ground testing. So it's important to make sure that a uh, part is well grounded when applying powder coating. Powder coating particles are charged by passing through an electrostatic field or by frictional charging. Uh, they are they will gravitate toward the grounded part. Uh, if the part is not properly grounded though, the powder will be uh, instead drawn into the powder recovery system. So it's very important to make sure uh, that you're not wasting powder and it's getting onto your part, giving you a good uh, finish. So the device used to measure this resistance uh, is usually used on the, the rail or hanger. Uh, it's called an ohm meter. If the resistance is greater than one meg ohm, the path to ground is not adequate. So this should be checked prior to coating. Uh, often the parts will have a buildup of powder uh, causing the part to be insulated. And so you just want to remove that powder and, uh, in order to reestablish that ground. Now, oven temperature profiling. So thermoset powders melt when exposed to elevated temperatures uh, in either convection or infrared cure ovens. The coating must be held uh, at temperature for a predetermined length of time to re reach the full cure. So many minutes at uh, so many degrees of temperature. So oven recorders are used to measure and store the temperature profiles of both the sample and the oven during the cure process. Uh, they help to minimize energy costs by avoiding running of the ovens at unnecessarily high temperatures or with long throughput times. Uh, many in, end users include oven profile tests in their statistical process control procedure. The device is used, uh, it's hung from a parts hanger uh, and the thermocouples are attached to the parts highest and lowest points or thinnest and thickest areas. Third thermocouple measures the air in the oven. Um, the conveyor is then run at common line speed. And now we'll talk about some of the aesthetic coating characteristics. Um, a high quality finish is becoming it has become increasingly important uh, for products. Powder coating. Powder coatings are designed to provide uh, a very wide range of surface types from glossy, uh, smooth to textured finishes. Like other appearance attributes such as color and gloss, smooth smoothness is a visual property that is an important part of the coating's decorative function. 
It must be consistent to be acceptable. Smoothness standards are a set of 10 powder coated panels showing the normal degrees of smoothness achieved with powder coatings. The panels have been graded from one, which would be the highest roughness with orange peel, to 10, a very smooth and glossy finish. The operator simply judges which panel is closest visually to that sample. Texture standards are a set of seven panels uh, showing the normal degrees of texturing uh, achievable with powder coatings. The panels are numbered one through seven. Number one having the least amount of texture, and seven having the most. And then we'll talk about gloss and color. Gloss is a sub subjective term used to describe the relative amount of mirror-like reflection. Uh, it's not appropriate for textured or very rough surfaces. The most commonly used instruments for measuring coating reflective appearance quality is a gloss meter. Gloss meters shine light at the surface and measure the amount of reflection at the opposite angle. The standard for glass measurement uh, specifies three geometries for measuring high, medium, and low gloss levels. The most common geometries used for powder coatings would be 20 and 60 degrees. The color of the sample may be evaluated uh, by visual or instrumental methods. Uh, color may look different in different lighting and at different angles. As a result, two samples may match under one set of viewing conditions, but not in another. The proper method for evaluation uh, is to compare the sample to a known standard while both are at the same viewing angle and illuminated by a standardized light source. Lighting conditions used for evaluations are very important as the observed color is a function of the coating's reflectance properties, the light source, and the color uh, vision of the individual observer. To confirm visual results uh, and for greater accuracy, a color measurement device is used uh, to make numerically quantifying visual observations. Measurements are usually made using a colorometer. The distinctness of image or DOI of a coating is uh, related to both gloss and smoothness. It's a parameter which describes the visual distortion seen in a reflection of an object viewed in a textured uh, surface. It can be quantified instrumentally by measuring the spread of a beam of light after it's been reflected from a surface. Surfaces which reflect an image perfectly without any distortion have a DOI of 100, while surfaces uh, with no image clarity would have a DOI of zero. Contrast ratio describes the ability of the coating to hide variations in the substrate color. Uh, it's determined by measuring the reflectance of a coating when applied uh, at equal film thickness to a substrate that is white on one half and black on the other. Great, thanks Ian. So in our next uh, module here, we're gonna talk about physical characteristics of the final powder coating film. So we're gonna start here with coating thickness, and that's largely because coating thickness and the cured coating thickness is arguably the most single important measurement made during the, the application and inspection. And the reason why is because Powder coatings and liquid applied coatings are designed to perform to their intended function and specifications when applied within a thickness range decided by the manufacturer. A film that's too thin may show bare substrate through the coating or it may not have the performance properties expected. And, but on the other hand, a coating that's too thick may have an incorrect color or a wrong gloss level or just might have too much texture. Uh, excessive film thickness, of course, also risks, risks the possibility of an incomplete cure and can drastically reduce the efficiency of your process. 
They can also mean poor adhesion, chipping or peeling from the substrate. Regular testing can reduce the number of reworks and customer returns due to finishing impacts. So we're going to talk about coating thickness at a, several different points in your operation. Of course, the before cure option is only really uh, applicable to powder coaters, at least using electronic instrumentation, but both powder coaters and liquid applied coating uh, applicators can use combs or, uh, or notch gauges, that sort of thing, to get a general idea of the before cure thickness. After cure is, a, is the more common way to measure coating thickness and uses an array of different types of instruments. So first we'll measure, or we'll mention probably the most basic way to measure co uh, cured coating thickness, which is to use a micrometer. The way these work is you take two measurements, one of the uncoated part, and then another of the part after it's gone through the coating process. And the difference between those measurements is your overall coating thickness. Now, if you coated your part on both sides, remember that you'll have to divide that number by two and assuming that your coating is the same thickness on both sides. It's not commonly done anymore, especially as other methods have become more economical and easier to use, and because of the errors inherent in the process, and the fact you need access to the bare substrate. If you're looking for a non, uh, an in, a, a destructive test, one that is very uh, clear, but also requires destroying the part, there's two common techniques. Um, but the main one is called the TUK gauge, the ASTM D4138 method, where basically you cut the coated part at a specific, a specific angle and view the cut microscopically. Now, the first method is to just cut the cross section of the part, cut the part literally in half and look at the side through a microscope. But that can be somewhat logistically challenging. So another uh, method is, uses a angled blade, often it's a 45 degree angle on a blade that you cut through the coating with all the way down to the substrate, and then use a microscope from the top with a reticule to measure the width of each uh, cut in the coating. And of course, since you can see in this diagram here, since you're at a 45 degree angle, your width from the top is the same as the thickness of the coating. So you can get an idea of your coating thickness that way, and also measure multiple layer thicknesses quite easily. For non-destructive methods, there are several uh, options and technologies used to take coating thickness. The three most common are magnetic for measurements of coatings on ferrous metal, usually steel, eddy current for measurements of coating on non-ferrous metal, metals, such as aluminum, most grades of stainless, titanium, et cetera, and the ultrasonic method of technology where you can measure coating thickness on non-metals and often even get uh, multiple layer thicknesses on non-metals. So first, let's discuss coating uh, thickness measurement on metal substrates. Now, these mechanical instruments are still surprisingly quite popular because they are accurate, they're relatively inexpensive, and they're also very, very accurate in the low range. And they don't require batteries, anything like that, and are often waterproof. They're quite simple. They ultimately use a calibrated magnet and a calibrated spring, and you measure the amount of force required to pull that magnet away from the coating. The more coating that's present means that you're further away from the substrate and the magnetic force is less. So the magnet will pull away easier and you can calibrate that scale from force to a degree of coating thickness, to a very accurate degree. But with the advent of electronic instruments and statistical methods and an increase in the desire for reporting, electronic instruments have become much more popular. And of course, they also can measure on both ferrous steel substrates, like a magnetic gauge can, and non-ferrous, aluminum or titanium, et cetera, substrates. And these are by far the most common type of inspection equipment used in the liquid applied and powder coating industries. They're pretty much ubiquitous. And generally, this is the first instrument that most coders will purchase. So there are a couple different ways to measure, take any measurement in, in on the equipment we're talking about today, but specifically in coating thickness, there are a few options you have. Of course, the most basic is to take a single measurement. The problem with that and why we never advise it is because you could have been on a piece of dirt or something, you could have found a locally low or high area. Ultimately, you're not getting a great view, a view in the overall coating thickness on the part and you're, you're liable to error. So this, at least the minimum recommended approach is to take an average of several measurements. 
But most commonly, more and more powder coaters and liquid applied coaters are using a statistical method such as SSPC PA2 or ISO 19840 to use statistics and uh, a specified sampling method to get an overall idea of the coating thickness of the, on the part. I'll quickly take a moment to mention that nowadays, a lot of coating thickness instrumentation and other instrumentation, instrumentation has the ability to interchange probes. So you can inter interchange between any type of coating thickness probe, whether it's for really small surfaces, large ones, thin coatings, thick, or even environmental, surface profile, uh, salt contamination, ultrasonic coating, and other types of probes. So that's another really handy uh, facet that uh, coating thickness and associated technologies have, is that you can often use the same gauge body with interchangeable probes. Speaking of ultrasonic coating thickness, that's the, the type of instrument we're looking at here. And it's a relatively new advancement in the, uh, the coatings industry, maybe been around about 25 years now, so relatively new. Um, but it does something that most other, well, no other instrument could previous to this, which is measure on non-metals. And it does so using ultrasound, where a pulse of sonic energy is emitted into the coating. And off of any change in density, usually between either the coating and primer or the coating primer or substrate, you'll get a reflection. And by measuring how long those reflections take, you can get, uh, you can transmit or translate that into coating thickness. So a highly desirable measurement if you're measuring on uh, coating on non-metals, especially concrete and wood. It's a very popular technology. With these instruments and pretty much or most of the instruments we'll be talking about today, there are four key measuring steps. And these are actually uh, listed right in ASTM D7091, which is the ASTM standard for coating thickness measurement. The first step is to calibrate, usually performed by a manufacturer or a qualified calibration lab. The second step, which is a good step for any uh, quality instrument, is to verify operation. Use reference standards or other types of materials to ensure your instrument is working properly. The third step, which is most specific to coating thick thickness instrumentation, is to adjust the instrument. Make sure the gauge's thickness readings match those of a known sample, because things like curvature, proximity to an edge, thickness of the substrate, etc can affect a coating thickness gauge even when it's measuring properly. So you generally want to adjust or at least verify adjustment uh, before measuring. And finally, take your measurements as we discussed earlier, usually at least taking an average, but even better, a statistical, um, use a statistical method. So now that we've discussed measuring coating thickness after cure, I'm gonna quickly discuss a uh, you know, technology that's emerged really in the last 15 or so years, which is measuring dry powder, which is powder before cure. And that's because, especially for the powder coating industry and the powder coaters that, uh, among us here, making corrections to your coating after drying or curing requires really expensive labor, uh, may contaminate or damage the part, et cetera, and create adhesion issues. So measuring coating thickness while you're applying the powder and it can be still be removed is highly desirable. So while the most specifications specify cured targets, it is possible to determine your predicted cured thickness or the thickness of the dry powder prior to curing. And there are three broad types of instruments that are used to do so. There are first, it's called a powder comb. And this, is, this has an analog in the liquid applied coatings industry. It's usually called just a comb gauge or a notch gauge. And the way they work in both industries is similar. I believe I have a picture here. Everybody can, you get one animation anyways. Oh, there it goes. The idea is you drag the, the gauge through the powder or coating while it's still wet. And there are two feet on either side and several teeth or little notches with the point at a different height away from the substrate. And you can measure the dry powder thickness or dry coat or wet coating thickness by just uh, looking at the pattern that that comb gauge makes and looking at the highest tooth that left a mark and the next highest tooth that didn't leave any mark. And that range, that is the range of your pre-cured powder or pre-cured liquid applied coating thickness. Another option that is much less popular lately, it used to be more popular, uh, prior to the third uh, type of instrument coming out that I'll get to shortly, is a magnetic gauge with a special type of probe. And it has very small pins that penetrate right down to the substrate. And then the probe is slowly pressed down 
onto the surface of the powder. And the result is you get a thickness measurement with very minimal uh, disturbance of the powder. Now, these two methods, the key is they only result in a height measurement of the uncured powder. And as many of you might know, powders and liquid applied coatings can shrink substantially during the curing process by as much as 50%. So for these types of instruments, a reduction factor needs to be used to translate these uh, uncured powder and coating thicknesses to the ultimate cured thickness that usually your specification revolves around. So finally, this has become by far the most common method for measuring uncured powder thickness is these non-contact ultrasonic instruments. The way they work is they use this airborne non-contact ultrasonic technology. So you bring the instrument close to the part, a specific distance away, and it'll use ultrasound to automatically calculate and display a predicted cured thickness. So that means that the measurement this instrument provides should be identical or within tolerance to the measurement that a dry powder or a cured powder gauge or a dry foam thickness gauge would read after the part has gone through the oven. This only applies to powder, it does not work on liquid applied coatings. So that's a brief summary of the landscape for dry film or film thickness gauges. Now we're going to just talk through the rest of the uh, physical characteristics that can be measured and are commonly measured. First of all, impact. It's a real good indicator of a coating's ability to withstand a sudden physical stress. And that is a very common uh, challenge for these coatings out in the field is stone chips or big uh, impacts to your part that you don't want to have the coating fail during. So you're testing the ability to withstand a force expressed in inch pounds. Usually the most common way of doing this test is using a big tall impact tester. So you often these are several feet tall and you drop a cylinder of a precise weight down onto the panel from different heights. The instrument is graduated with different heights. And the reported value is the maximum impact height that did not crack the coating at a specific film thickness on a specific substrate with, when evaluated with a minor magnification. So a very popular test. Flexibility comes into play uh, particularly when the coated part will undergo future st steps, uh, processes, such as bending, et cetera, where you don't want the coating to fail as it's going through your bending processes. So the test for measuring flexibility, at least the most common one, is called a mandrel bend tester, and usually a conical mandrel bend tester. The way these work is that you coat a test panel of a specific size and place it in an instrument like the one you see on this screen and use that mandrel, place it over that conical section and use the mandrel and that press to form the panel and push that panel over top of that conical mandrel. And that creates a variance in radius from side to side on that panel. And your ultimate reading is how far across that panel you can make before uh, the coating starts failing to uh, under magnification because of course on one side, it's a very a wide radius, a very uh, easy test. And at the other side of that panel, it's a very, very tight radius that uh, generally will start cause nearly any coating to, to crack. Adhesion can be measured in um, uh, several ways. And that's because it's such an important parameter. Any coating you apply, it's critically important that it sticks to the part it's been applied on. A coating that's fallen off really isn't doing its job. And there are a few ways we're gonna outline that uh, to measure adhesion, a few of the popular ways. The first one is the knife adhesion test. It's popular because you really don't need any materials or any specific test equipment for it. It's as simple as getting a ruler and a knife and using the standard, which uh, outlines it, which is ASTM D6677, you scribe an X pattern uh, using an exacto knife and a ruler at two different angles. And then use that knife to try and peel away coating at the intersection of those two scribes. And the standard walks you through how to evaluate the adhesion from a zero to 10 scale. The challenge with this test method is it's highly subjective. At the end of the day, the, in, the uh, inspector themselves is trying to peel away coating and is responsible for the force used to create that scribe. So a slight uh, enhancement on the test is called the cross hatch and tape adhesion test. Somewhat similar to the uh, X cut method, but instead, generally a specific pattern, a cross hatch pattern is, is used. 
And the way it works is you scribe a crosshatch either using a tool with multiple blades at a specific distance away from one another, or a, uh, a, a stencil that allows you to use an X-Acto knife to create this pattern. And of course, I should briefly mention there is a, a version of this test that still uses the X cut, but it's much less popular nowadays. But the difference between the previous method I mentioned is that instead of picking away at the coating with the edge of a knife, a specific type of tape is used with a, that has a, a generally a specific force. You place that tape on the pattern you cut, remove it, and then you evaluate what the, the, the pattern looks like after you've removed that tape, and you compare it to several images listed in the standard. It's still a qualitative test. It doesn't give you a number, but it has a little bit more re repeatability than the X-cut test. Finally, pull-off adhesion testing is really has become by far the most popular type of adhesion testing because it's much more quantitative and it's much more, um, much less influenced by the operator. The way this test works is you adhere a loading fixture or a dolly down to the substrate using usually a two-part epoxy or a cyanoacrylate. And once that epoxy is cured, you use the adhesion tester to pull that loading fixture away from the substrate, the, the, uh, the substrate. And generally, under best conditions, the coating will pull away and you can uh, read what force the coating, uh, what force the coating pulled away. Now for powder coatings, generally these instruments cannot uh, generate enough force to pull the powder coating away from the substrate just because they're so tightly adhered. So for those uh, coatings, these instruments are a great way to show that at least you withstood a certain uh, adhesion force. So even if the instrument tops out at, for example, 3000 PSI or 3300 PSI, you know that your coating has been adhered to at least that level, which often can be a pass, often may, might match or beat your, uh, your specifications you're trying to meet. So these have become a very popular uh, instrument. They're extremely popular in the liquid coatings industry and becoming increasingly popular in the powder coating industry, just because of the limitations of the tests we discussed previously. Next, quickly, we'll mention the pencil hardness test. It's a very simple concept, but has become a very popular test because it's relatively inexpensive to employ, and it gives you reasonably good results. Um, for those of you who might take everybody back a fair bit, but have you ever had an art class or did a little bit of art in, uh, in high school, that sort of thing, you might remember that there are different grades of pen pencil lead. Everybody knows the HB pencil hardness, uh, which is the most common. But there are the H, the H scale, H1, H2, H3, actually goes uh, above the HB uh, hardness level. And those, that scale describes different hardnesses of pencil lead. So by using either a little jig or just a prescribed angle and force, the way this test works is you use incrementally harder pencils press them at a 45 degree angle against the coating, and you note which pencil lead hardness caused the coating to fail, started to penetrate through the coating. And you report the hardness uh, by the number, of the, the number of the lead that was able to poke through that coating. There are other methods to measure uh, hardness, such as the sword rocker or the noop testing, but they require specific equipment, and for most coders, this pencil hardness test is really all they need, and for that reason, it's quite popular. Finally, I'm going to quickly go mention abrasion resistance, because often many of you likely have parts that need to withstand some sort of external abrasion or chipping, that sort of thing. So abrasion is typically, testing is generally performed with something called a Tabor abraser, which is a brand name, but it's become almost ubiquitous where you place a panel, a coated panel, into the, the apparatus, and then the uh, unit rotates that panel using specific weights and abrasive wheels of a specific hardness for a certain amount of, uh, of time. And the loss of coating that results from using that abrasor is, is measured as, as the weight that's been lost. Another test that's sometimes used is a falling sand abrasion tester, where you effectively drop sand down a vertical tube onto the part that's mounted at a 45 degree angle. And the results are given as the amount of sand required to remove a certain thickness of coating. There is a test also for measuring edge coverage, which is the degree to which powder and materials cover sharp corners, generally using the uh, ratio of face thickness um, to edge thickness. The challenge is there's no 
instrumental method to measure this. You generally have to use calipers to measure the ratio of the uh, edge coverage to the face coverage. So it's a, a kind of a limited test. And finally, uh, the chip resistance test. This is especially important for people uh, coding things like lawnmower decks, et cetera, where there is uh, exposure to rocks, that sort of thing uh, being projected at your part. So one of the most common is call, uh, instruments to measure and to uh, quantitate, or um, yeah, quantitatively measure chip resistance is called a gravelometer, where the uh, test sample is placed inside the unit and gravel is projected pneumatically uh, to determine how well your part can uh, resist chipping, that sort of thing. And back over to Ian. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to talk about uh, some of the environmental characteristics. Um, so first, solvent, stain, and chemical resistance. So solvent resistance testing uh, determines the ability of a coating to do just that, resist solvent. Uh, the test involves rubbing the surface of a baked film uh, with cheesecloth that is soaked with methyl ethyl ketone, or MEK, uh, until failure uh, of the, the film occurs. The test is used widely because it provides quick uh, relative estimation of degree of cure without having to wait for long-term exposure results. Now, stain and chemical resistance, uh, to test stain and chemical resistance, spots of various agents are placed on fully cured powder uh, coated panels for a specified time. Uh, and when the time has elapsed, the panel is cleaned and rated. Next, we'll talk humidity and corrosion testing uh, or salt spray testing. So, we know water can cause the degradation of coatings. So, knowledge of how a coating resists water is helpful for assessing how long it will perform in actual service. Failure in tests at 100% relative humidity or in water fog tests may be caused by a number of factors, including a deficiency in the coating uh, itself, uh, contamination of the substrate, or inadequate surface preparation. A typical humidity testing technique uh, uses a closed cabinet in which test panels are exposed to 100% relative humidity. Many test chambers can be converted to perform either salt spray or water fog testing. Uh, the entire specimen is placed in the exposure area, allowing condensation to form on all surfaces. Failure is determined by observing blistering, loss of adhesion, film undercut, or significant changes in appearance. Salt spray or salt fog testing evaluates coating resistance to another type of corrosive element. Scribed or unscribed panels are placed in a cabinet and examined periodically for deterioration. Accelerated weathering testing is one of the most important evaluations made by, by powder manufacturers and applicators. Uh, it measures the changes in appearance that occur when these products are exposed to various types of exterior uh, exposure element or conditions. Uh, it estimates the performance of coatings when in use outdoors uh, and exposed to ultraviolet light. And now quality control. Uh, as mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, customers often choose suppliers that have a good quality control system. So by investing in a simple system that records and analyzes uh, measurement results, coders can study trends, reduce costs, and retain customers by providing them with documentation showing their ability to meet the required specification. A quality assurance program can be as simple as developing a procedure that calls for a certain number of measurements to be taken at the same location on each part. By recording all values, variations can be analyzed at regular intervals and corrective action taken if necessary. 
Manually gathering data with pen and paper is time consuming and error prone and can add significant cost to a coding project. Uh, it used to be you might see a quality inspector with a mechanical testing instrument uh, and another walking by behind him with a clipboard taking notes. Now modern electronic instruments gather and store almost limitless inspection points and then network and data directly uh, to other devices for evaluation. Automating the task for collecting readings is the best way to keep costs under control and to reduce human error. In, in digital format, data can be easily stored, reported, and So traditionally, uh, yeah, we're going to, you know, as Ian nicely teed me up, uh, the value of digital, digital reporting, storage, et cetera, is clear. Traditionally, uh, data was usually transferred right to desktop software or program running on a PC. While some instruments can wirelessly, wirelessly transmit each measurement as it's taken to a process controller or a computer, it's more common to store all measurements into a memory and then download them to a PC at the end of the work shift, work shift or when the job is complete. That can be done using a USB cable, Bluetooth, or Wi-Fi communication. Simple analysis of that data typically requires software from the instrument manufacturer. But there is third-party software uh, with workflow plus processing systems that help keep jobs running smoothly. They track customer parts from receipt, and they move as they move through your part, through to final delivery. The traditional approach has limitations and complications. PC-based software requires installation on individual computers, training, hardware maintenance, and regular software updates. So cloud computing, on the other hand, has started to change that. Cloud's a really general term for anything that involves delivering services over the internet. But as we see it in inspection, it's become uh, more and more common to have instruments directly reporting information right to the cloud, so that it can be downloaded and viewed from anywhere around the world. It eliminates the need to invest in uh, equipment and servers, as well as the personnel required to maintain it. Everything's uh, handled right at the cloud server. Now, small operators, they can even use simpler approaches. Newly, new instruments have built-in memory, such as uh, called USB mass storage, that has replaced a lot of older interfaces and can be used to rep uh, view reports right from the gauge. So there's lots of options available now. You can see on this slide just some of, the, some of them that are available that have made uh, reporting and data collection just so much easier. And I think uh, that brings us to the end. Yeah, I think we have a thank you slide there. So uh, just uh, in the few minutes we have remaining, wondering, uh, Looks like, yeah, if we have any questions, looks like one's popped up on the screen here. Uh, so while I'm answering it, feel free to uh, write in any more. Um, but the first one, I guess we can swap over back to the camera. Please turn that back on. So first question I have here uh, is, it's not clear whether this is for powder or for liquid applied, but the, uh, the question that's been asked is, what are the uh, typical first instruments uh, for a coding applicator? And the answer to that question is a little bit different depending on whether you're a powder applicator or a liquid applied coating applicator. I'd suggest that regardless of which you are, a dry film thickness gauge is usually your first instrument just because it affects so much. It affects really all the other tests that we might mention here. For powder coaters, often the next instrument is an MEK test to, to determine how uh, well cured the powder is. Um, and also, you know, from there, a ground test air, uh, testing instrument, such as a Megger, from there, uncured powder is quickly becoming the, uh, a very common instrument to have in most shops, just because of the price of rework and the ability to train new applicators on how much powder they're applying, especially for batch or smaller production levels. So that's what I'd say the most common instruments are for powder. For liquid applied coders, I'd say, of course, again, a dry film thickness would be most popular. And then I think uh, second most and third most popular together would be uh, a dew point meter for measuring environmental conditions and a surface profile gauge for measuring the profile height, generally because most liquid applied uh, coating applicators 
are going to be measuring over blasted substrates, although that's becoming more and more common for powder too. So those three instruments, the dry film, the environmental, and the surface profile gauge are typically the first three instruments that most uh, liquid applied coders will use. And I don't think any more questions have come through unless Kelly, uh, you've seen any that I haven't. I don't, Mike. Um, great job, of course, as always, you guys have uh, really good information for everyone out there. So we appreciate your, your sharing all of that with us. Um, and as you'll, you'll see on the screen, the CCAI website, of course, is listed, ccaiweb.com. So be sure to, to check that. The events tab will have a calendar of the rest of the CCAI chapter events and national events. Um, our next webinar in the series is going to be August 19th, and it's a look into the architectural market, what it takes to become a certified architectural coder. So check that out if you're interested. We would love to have you all again. Um, Mike and Ian, thanks so much, and uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank Kelly. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.